And today in class, one of your colleagues asked a question when we were talking about the tetrahedral geometry and the bond angle of 109.5 degrees. And basically the question was, what do you mean 109.5 degrees? Where does that come from? I found it kind of an annoying question, but you know, it's one of those where you just, you know, poo-pooed it and go on. But it actually really is a very good question. And I want to essentially show you where that comes from. This is going to be one of these you know, truly supplementary videos in that uh, it's not uh, related directly to uh, anything that we're, you know, an end of chapter questions or in master in chemistry. But it is a really good question. It's kind of an interesting uh, thing where it actually comes from. And it, it comes out of the observation that we began that geometry stuff by you know, essentially taking what the way we kind of approach it is you take a circle and you know if, when you do the linear geometry you're essentially taking that circle in half and the bond angle would be half of the 360 degrees of a circle you know the 180 degrees and then we introduce the trigonal planar geometry which is in a sense taking a circle and cutting up into three where we get the 120 degree uh, uh, ge uh, pl uh, bond angle uh, for a trigonal planar geometry. And then the next one was tetrahedral, ooh, four regions of electrons around the central atom. And your natural inclination is to say, okay, we got to divide it up into four, the bond angles will be 90 degrees. And in fact, when we first did it, and we had, I had the students you know, on the floor uh, standing around me trying to make the geometry, that's exactly what we did. And that is, turns out to be incorrect. And so the part of the problem with, you know, where that 109.5 degrees comes from is that it doesn't come from a circle. It comes from a three-dimensional object um, and, you know, almost more like a sphere. And so what we're going to do is take a look at, you know, kind of carefully where that, uh, where it comes from and how it works. And in order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up on the board here um, a cube. It turns out the tetrahedron is often thought of as you know the shape you get when the outer atoms are occupying alternating corners of a cube. This graphic here does a pretty good job of trying to show that where the where they kind of superimpose the tetrahedron and the the cube uh, over it to kind of see how the outer atoms are in alternating corners of a cube. And so to do this, I really need a kind of a nicely drawn cube here. That's going to take me a few moments, so we'll you know, we'll buzz through this really quickly and pick it up from there. the cube and what I've done is I've put it on a set of axes X Y Z three-dimensional axes and I've marked the vertices uh, essentially with their coordinates we're just going to say that each uh, side of the cube is one unit long whether this is one cubic inch or one cubic foot one cubic meter doesn't matter so I've marked all the coordinates and then I want to mark off uh, a couple of the components of my tetrahedron and if the tetrahedron is alternating corners of the sphere, let's put a big dot there, there, those two, and on the bottom side, these two. Those are the parts where the outer atoms of a tetrahedron are. And then in the dead center of the cube, okay, is this point here. And it is in the dead center in both the x, y, and z directions. So its coordinates are one half one half, one half is exactly one half, you know, unit in the front along the Z, one half unit to the right along the Y, one half unit up along the Z axis, so X, Y, Z. And I'm going to look at, for my tetrahedron, I'll draw this in by hand, this triangle. That's the interesting one for my purposes. That's the top part of the tetrahedron, and that is the angle. That's going to be, I'm calling it theta at the moment, 
that is the angle that's going to be the 109.5. Now, I'm going to need the dimensions of this triangle for a moment. We're going to work on that and pull it out and work on it over here. But there is one other thing I can tell you about that triangle. If this side is one unit long, this side is one unit wide, then Pythagorean theorem tells me that this, the hypotenuse of that triangle, is the square root of 2. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull that triangle out so I can work on it, kind of pull it out of this kind of three-dimensional drawing. So it's a little bit easier to work with. I'm going to go ahead and use the ruler again just to get myself some kind of pretty straight, or hopefully relatively pretty straight lines. So that one, I want to go down to there and go up to there somehow. And I'm going to mark those coordinates. This is point one half, one half, one half. This is point zero one one, and this is point zero zero one. And that is theta. That's the angle I'm after. I'll have to prove that's 109.5 in this shape. This is the square root of two. Now. Pythagorean theorem from over here. Now I need to these two sides worked out and they are going to be the same and so I'm going to show one of them. And remember essentially the calculation for the distance between any two points it looks fearsome but it's really not too hard to work with x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 minus y2 squared keep them in the same order plus z1 minus z2 squared, and yep, square root of all that. That's the distance between any two points. Going ahead and plugging that in for a moment, make my calculations here. I'll go choose this as my x1, that point is my x2, 1 half minus 0 squared plus, okay, 1 half minus 1 squared plus 1 half minus 1 squared, square root of all that. And that breaks down to 1 fourth plus negative 1 half squared, which is 1 fourth, plus negative 1 half squared, which is 1 fourth, square root of all that. In other words, 3 over 4, square root of 3 fourths, equals square root of 3 over 2. That dimension, square root of 3 over 2. And if I repeat that over here, the same thing on this side. Okay. Now, there are the sides of my triangle that I've pulled out of this cube. And I need one last bit of information. And in order to get that, I'm going to clear this space out of the way. So, the magic eraser. And, draw another triangle. And this one doesn't have to be near as pretty, because it's just for the example. When I was first looking at this one, after the student asked the question, I knew there was something out there, but to be honest with you, it, I couldn't remember it until I Googled it. You Google law of cosines. Oh, there's a good phrase for you. And if you do that, there it is here. This is one of the bits of information I found, which I thought was quite useful. They label the angles, capital ABC, in the corresponding side, small case ABC. And then the law of cosines says, and here's just the equation, A squared equals B squared plus C squared plus, and make sure I get this right, and I didn't, it was minus, and I minus, there we go, minus 2bc cosine of angle a. Now, for our, my purposes here, translating the, these symbols into what I have, length a, square root 2, lengths b and c, square root 3, over 2. A, is theta, and my 
uh, set up here. The other two angles don't matter. So what I'm going to do is just plug my information into the law of cosines equation. And so let's see, I've got for a square root of 2 squared. So plugging it in, I get me a 2 equals, make sure I get to follow along here, square root of 3 over 2 squared, which is 3 over 4. Now that's square root of 3 over 2 squared plus square root of 3 over 2 squared, 3 over 4, minus 2 times square root of 3 over 2 times square root of 3 over 2 to BC cosine theta. Theta is my only unknown. That's the one I'm after. So, do a little bit of other rearranging in here for a moment. Six-fourths minus, and then this one here, multiply that, that's going to be three over four, and then with the three over four, two cancer e halves, cosine theta, and then move the six-fourths to the other side. That's going to give me, I'm almost out of room down here, so let me squeeze it in over here. Move the six-fourths to the other side. It's going to give me one-half equals negative 3 halves cosine theta. Get the 3 halves, the negative 3 halves to the other side. That's going to become negative 2 thirds times 1 half equals cosine theta. And therefore cosine theta equals, and you work that out, negative 1 third. Okay, thus theta is the inverse cosine of, oops, negative one-third. And it's one of the most gratifying moments in thinking about this stuff when you punch that out on your calculator. You put in negative one-third or negative 0.3333 and hit your inverse cosine button, and what should pop out in the calculator but 109.47 something 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 degrees. 109.5 degrees. I saw that and must admit I wept a little bit when I saw it. It could just fall out of there. So there it is. Why 109.5? It's not an obvious number like 90 degrees or 120 or 180. That's where it comes from. It actually comes from the fact that the tetrahedron is a three-dimensional object. Uh, you're dividing up uh, you know, an object that's three-dimensional, and you can see it's a little bit more involved than it is when you're just carving up a circle. But it's not a bad problem in analytic geometry, and there's where the number comes from. So there you go. Go think about it, and see you later.